Stravo, and welcome to The Rest is History. Now, you may be wondering why I welcomed you in Serbian. And the answer, Tom, is that we have reached the Balkan Republic in a survey of the countries that have qualified for this year's World Cup in Qatar. You chose to do Serbia. You were very keen to do it. Yeah, I was. I would have liked to have done it, but but you chose to do it. What would you have chosen to do? Oh. Something involving 20th century coups. I might have chosen the Black Hand, but do you know what, Tom? I'd probably have chosen the Battle of Kosovo Polje. Okay. The Field of the Blackbirds. That's probably what I'd have chosen. Okay. You're looking deflated with me saying that. No, not at all. <laughs> not, not, at all not at all. So we... we Obviously, before recording episodes, we have discussed, haven't we, what we're going to do. Yeah. So I think I ended up choosing uh, Stefan Dusan, the great 14th century Serbian emperor. Yeah. Which is what you may be expecting me to do. That, that is what I'm expecting you to do. But I'm not going to. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm ambushing you. I was really looking you. forward to that, Tom. No. I was really looking forward to it. I've got a totally new one. And the thing that will really excite you about this is that it's prehistory. Oh, for Christ's sake. You love a bit of prehistory, <laughs> don't you? It's not science, it's prehistory. Oh, for I look your little sake. face lighting up with joy. Uh, but, Dominic. Get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> th- this is actually a yeah. br- this is brilliant, I think. And I'd be interested in to see whether you agree. Okay. Because basically... Where would you say the first script, the first written language originated? Yeah. You might say Sumeria, you might say Mesopotamia, you might say No, I'd Egypt. probably say near Nish or Novi Sad, something like that in <laughs> Serbia. <laughs> You'd be right. Or would you? <laughs> because there is a possibility that yeah. the birthplace of written scripts was Serbia. Okay. And that yeah. Serbia was the home of one of the original great civilizations. Did you know that? No, I've never heard that claim made before. A place of, of urban settlements, the first place to develop copper smelting, perhaps the first place to develop a uh, written language. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's not the kind of thing that's generally known. Tom, you've got a bit of work to do to convince me, I'll be frank with you. Well, it has to be said, it has to be said that it, it, is, it is much debated. Yeah. But I think this is a genuinely unexpected, I mean, I, I, I hadn't realised this at all. And yeah. so I was reading through about Serbian history and came across this and thought, actually, this is this is much more interesting. So I had envisaged a, a Serbian history podcast, either involving men with revolvers shooting mm-hmm. archduchesses or just a lot of scimitars and the Ottomans lurking in the background. But what you didn't expect was Serbia as the birthplace of the first great European civilization. So Serbian listeners are, are very strong following in Serbia. They'll be delighted by this, Tom. By and large, the Serbian take on this is at the stronger end of... <laughs> Arguing that this is the birthplace of civilization. There are others who are more skeptical. However, so so this story begins with a guy called Milhe Vasic. And I hope Mm -hmm. that I've pronounced his name right. He was a very, very long lived bloke. He was born in 1869 and he died in 1956. Uh, And so he lived through quite a lot of change. Yeah. So he lived through the collapse of the Austro Hungarian uh, Empire, the First World War, Mm -hmm. um, Second World War, communist period. In in these episodes, we've we've touched on characters who might come from Tintin books quite a lot, haven't we? Yeah, kind we have. of generals who lead coups and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, people with dark glasses. Milhe Vasic, if you imagine Professor Calculus, you would not be far wrong. Right. He had a, a, a kind of goatee. Uh, he was bald, very scholarly, and he was Serbia's first and greatest archaeologist. And this was he, he was born at a time where there wasn't, I think, a great tradition of archaeology in Serbia. And he went to study in Germany, got his, his doctorate there, came back to Serbia in 1901. And he was both a museum director in Belgrade, and he ended up professor of archaeology at uh, Belgrade University. So he, he's absolutely, you know, if you want Serbian archaeology, he is yeah. your man. And basically, he, <laughs> he was so famous and... He was, he was so much the big man in Serbian archaeology that in various ways he was in post until he was 86. Crikey. And, he's, and he just kept surviving all these regime changes. Yeah. So it didn't matter you know, who was in charge. He was, he was the guy who would be going off and doing his excavations. And he is most famous for excavations at a particular village called Vincha, which okay. is just outside Belgrade. And it's now been basically swallowed up by Belgrade. So it's a, it's a kind of suburb now. And the focus of his excavations was um, a, a great mound, about 12 meters high, uh, called Belo Brudo. Again, I hope my pronunciation <laughs> is right. Dominic, you could help me on that. Is that, is that right? Uh, is that, is that Belo? I think you just have to say it. And, yeah, I, I think... Belo Brudo. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know anything, Tom. Okay, I mean, I'm just okay. pretending. 
But well, you you would know you'd recognise that that is in English the White Hill. Yeah, and on the on the surface there were, there were uh, remnants of kind of a medieval settlement. So so he knew that it was a medieval settlement, but he also suspected that it was a tell. And a tell it's um, a, a word that comes from uh, Near Eastern archaeology, and basically it's a description of a, a hill that is just nonstop human settlement. So basically, you dig down and down and down, and the whole way through, it's just kind of human rubbish. And right. so, he wanted to know, well, you know, how far can I get down through all this kind of, the, you know, this layer after layer of cultural debris? And he begins work in 1908, and it gets obviously interrupted by the First World War. So that's bad. And then after the war, the government of Yugoslavia emerges, and it's too skint to basically fund his excavations. He has a brief spell in, in 1924. But then, because word is getting out internationally that the finds that he's making as he goes further and further down through this tell, through these kind of layers of different civilizations, different periods, are really unexpected and fascinating. He gets backing from Britain. From Britain. From, from British, very assorted British businessmen. And so he digs from 1929 through to 31, and the excavations there continue to this day. And what has provoked the interest of these businessmen in Britain is the fact that he has discovered traces of an incredibly sophisticated civilization right at the bottom of this huge great mound. Wow. And what he's found, he's found, so he's found all kinds of fascinating things. He's found ceramics with very complex decorations, kind of swirls and whirls and little symbols. So we'll come back to them. Yeah. He's found a lot of sculptural art, including over 2000 kind of figurative representations, so little figurines. And I was looking, I was reading a book about, about this. And in the index, uh, it's a book on the subject in the index, a listed bears, birds, Death symbol birds, ducks, frogs, gorgons, hedgehogs, rams, the snake goddess, spirals, stream motifs, and vulvas. So right, okay. uh, there are little um, kind of clay images of all those things. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to <laughs> dwell on some of those. I'm not a massive prehistory person, but that is an extraordinary um, collection of finding. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you agree. And once this has been found, people start looking elsewhere and they find kind of, you know, at this layer, similar yeah. trace elements. And they find, for instance, evidence of copper smelting and they find houses, some of which contain two or three rooms and streets. And all these settlements are that they're centered on Serbia. The, the arc of them reaches northwards of Serbia and southwards down to the yeah. Aegean. Um, they're all by rivers. They're generally 20 or so acres. And the largest have populations up to about 4,000. So, you know, pretty substantial. 4, pretty substantial. I mean, that is substantial. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a town. I mean, that's a sizable town. But, well, I don't know what time period we're talking well, about. Well, th so that's the question. That is the que exactly the question. So when um, Vasic is excavating in the, the 20s and the 30s, this is before carbon dating has been developed. So there's no way of, of, of precisely dating them. The only way you can do it is, is through stratigraphy. So that's the key thing about these mounds of, with the different layers. You can kind of work it out from that way. So you dig through the medieval layers, the classical layers, and then you're going down. But it's an open question really when these are. Yeah. Uh, and essentially the, the best way to do it is to work out, well, are there, you know, um, say the pottery, are, do they resemble pots that you might find elsewhere? That are more conclusively dated. So Vasic, when he is, you know, he's he, he's chiefly got British backers. So he he writes an article in 1930 in the Illustrated London News, and he claims that it, that what he has found is a centre of Aegean civilization in the second millennium BC. And he points out, as evidence for this, that the ceramic ware that he has found in his site in Vincha bears similarities to ceramic ware in the earliest layers of Troy. So Crikey. he's saying kind of, you know, 1500 BC. And his assumption is that this is an Anatolian settlement, that the people who were responsible for building Troy, that they've kind of spread westwards yeah. and colonized Serbia and built these settlements. And this is what it's evidence for. Over the course of his life, he changes his mind about this because he is unsettled by the sophistication of what he's found. Right. And he ends up thinking that actually this is a Greek colony. 7th or 6th century BC. 
And one of the reasons why he comes to this conclusion is that the people who are making these um, figurines are absolutely obsessed by masks. So again and again, you get these kind of portraits of, uh, of humans, but they're obviously wearing masks. Mm. And the effect is very, very unsettling. So you might have a, a head with an obviously female hairdo, but a male face, and that's because um, she is wearing a mask. There are masks that look very, very like the kind of aliens that you get at Roswell. <laughs> so if you think <laughs> of word. the kind of things in the X-Files or whatever, yeah. they, they look very, very similar. You get animal masks with horns, with kind of, you know, ears or whatever. A lot of them imitate birds. So they're very, very, very weird. And I think that Vasic is intrigued with the parallels of the masks that you find on, on Minoan Crete. Yeah. And then, of course, you get masks in Athenian tragedy. Yeah. And so he's thinking these are Hellenic, probably. Can I uh, jump in, Tom? Yeah. So he published that article in the Illustrated London News in 1930. Yeah. And that's a point where, just thinking about the political context for his research, Serbia is the dominant partner in the new, what becomes the Yugoslav kingdom, kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes as it becomes, I mean, you know, fa famously, like all these states in the debris of the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires, very, very nationalistic. But it, you could see why it would play well in Britain, because, of course, Britain had been Serbia's ally in World War I. So something that bigs up Serbia mm -hmm. would, it would have a kind of sentimental appeal. But then he has the argument, first of all, that it's Anatolian, and then later, Greek. Greek. Um, yeah. And it, that sort of, that surprises me, because I yeah. would have thought he would say, Oh, this is in some sort of indigenous Serbian tradition to which, to which we are are really the heirs. Well, so he's a he's a he's a scholar with an international reputation. Yeah, and he is doing best practice. So he's not saying we found this in Serbia, therefore it must be Serbian. Right. I think yeah. he's he's alert to the intellectual trends of the age, and mm -hmm. this is very much a period. You know, I mean, it's 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 an assumption that is basically true that. A lot of culture, including most obviously agriculture, has come from settlers moving out of the Near East through yeah. Anatolia into Europe. Um, and so he's, you know, this is kind of standard explanation at the time. Yeah. And I think that, you know, his, his going with, with the Greek thing is just because he's, you know, he's recognizing that there are possible links to Greek culture. And so this seems the obvious explanation. Okay. All right. I mean, he, I mean, he's so he's he's not he's um, not an overtly nationalist yeah. scholar. Okay. I mean, he's a proud Serbian, but he's he's happy to go with what he sees as the evidence. Yeah. But then the radiocarbon dating comes in, and okay. the radiocarbon dating reveals something amazing, which is that this stuff is seven thousand years old. <gasps> what a twist! So that it, I did not expect. So the Vincha culture, as it comes to be called. Yeah. Named after this village that he's excavated, but which covers you know quite a broad spread of Serbia and beyond into into Romania and Bulgaria as well. That these settlements are, can be dated from um, five thousand seven hundred to four thousand two hundred BC. So that's a, a, a millennium and a half of grow increasingly sophisticated culture, and the implication of that is astounding, basically in the context of the age, because this implies that this is earlier than. Say Troy, it's yeah. earlier than earlier the Greeks. Earlier, definitely earlier than the Greek. Way, way earlier than the Greeks, but also earlier than you know the heyday of the Sumerian civilization. Much earlier than the emergence of pharaonic civilization in Egypt. So, really, really unexpected. And th the elements are definitely those of a kind of proto civilization of the kind that um, you know define the riverine civilizations of Mesopotamia or Egypt. Say so. You have very, very intensive agriculture and all these settlements, you know, they're on the edge of rivers. They seem to have been settled there, not so much because there's good game, you know, mm -hmm. so these are not uh, kind of wandering hunter gatherers. These are people who are settling in places that are agriculturally rich. So because of that, there's no, no, no plow has ever been found, but it is all pretty universally accepted that they must have had plows, yeah. that they were, they were plowing. They have parley, they're, they're, they introduce wheat, they're planting flax, which they are using to manufacture uh, clothing. And this in turn, the, you know, as will happen later in Mesopotamia and Egypt, this generates agricultural surplus, which in turn seems to have enabled these 
really quite large settlements to, I was about to, say, to grow to markets up. and towns. And presumably yeah. then, if you've got towns and you've got markets, you must have some sort of authority, kings? Or... We'll come to that. We will come to okay. that. Uh, you also have, in certain settlements, uh, have been built close to seams of copper ore. So evidence for industry. So there's a place called Plochnik in northern Serbia, which is actually first discovered in 1927 when they're developing a railway, but it's only excavated serious excavations in 1996. So these are, are quite recent and ongoing. And in 2008, they discover a copper axe, which is dated to 5,500 BC. And there's a, there's a site, Belavode, in uh, the Rudnik mountain, mm -hmm. uh, which I've uh, apparently is in central Serbia. I'm not sufficiently familiar with As your Serbian, Serbian geography. geography to, You're but, carrying but, it off with great uh, calm, I have to say. And what they find there is the world's oldest securely dated evidence of copper smelting. Wow. So this is, this is a Neolithic civilization that is, that is entering the Copper Age. And it seems, as far as we can tell from the archaeological evidence, to be the first culture anywhere that does this. So this is entering the age of metal, and it's happening in Serbia. Wow. So that's spectacular enough. Yeah. But the most dramatic possibility of all <gasps> is that the Vincha culture, yeah. these, you know, this unexpected civilization, that it might have developed writing. Because lots of these sites, I mentioned that Vincha itself has the, you know, the ceramics, the figurines, they're decorated with all kinds of symbols. But these start to be found in sites across Serbia and, and, and beyond. Um, and lots of them seem to be pictograms of animals. So, right. um, you know, rather in the way that, say, Chinese script or hieroglyphs, or indeed that actually the alphabet that we use, you can trace them back to, um, you know, portraits of oxes, heads or whatever. So there's that. Uh, there are swastikas, there are crosses, there are chevrons. And in all, there are about five and a half thousand of these different symbols. And so people started wondering, well, what do they represent? Yeah. And... That question is turbocharged by a fine that is made in 1961 in a village called Tataria, which I'm afraid for Serbian listeners isn't actually in Serbia. It's in Romania, but you know, very amazing find. Yeah. And it's three small tablets, uh, which are just covered with these kind of Vincha symbols. We'll call them the Vin Vincha symbols. And they seem to be arrayed in, in what looks like a form of writing. And two of these tablets are rectangular. One is round. Oh, my God, Tom. I've just, I've just Googled them. They're amazing. They are amazing, aren't they? Yeah. So you can see, so, so, so one of the rectangular ones, the, the round one has holes drilled through it. Uh, the one that doesn't have a, a hole drilled through it has an illustration of a horned animal. Mm. Now, when they're found, they're unbaked. And so what the guy who does it orders is that they should be baked to preserve them. Okay. The problem with that is that it, this process prevents carbon dating. Oh, no. So they can't be carbon dated. But... The stratigraphy of it is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. They have been found at a layer that points to a date of about 5,500 BC. So around the same time as this copper axe is being manufactured. And these predate uh, Sumerian cuneiform, Egyptian hieroglyphs by about 2,000 years. Wow. So again, I mean, this is stupefying. Yeah. However, a lot of controversy surrounds them. Oh. Uh, and I think that we should probably take a break yeah, at this point. And when I come back, I will discuss the controversies. I have the nasty feeling, Tom, this is one of those podcasts that you do sometimes <laughs> where you talk for 20 minutes and it's very exciting. <laughs> then we take a break and you come back and you say, but. <laughs> well, no, then, no. I, they, they are genuinely mysterious and there is, okay. apps, there, there is a lot of debate around them. Well. Come back after the break and see if Tom does do one of his butts or whether it's still as there mysterious. Is a but. There is a but, but I think it's not an absolutely conclusive but. Okay, excellent. Come back after the break for a not absolutely conclusive but. See you in a minute. <laughs> Welcome back to The Rest is History. Tom has been guiding us through this extraordinarily mysterious story of the venture culture in um, Serbia, found by the archaeologist Miloje Vazic. And um, Tom, you left us sort of hanging at the end of the first half, talking about the discovery of this, these tablets, the sense that you know this is writing, this is civilization that predates the Sumerian culture or Egyptian, that this and, and it all kicked off in Serbia. And then you sort of ended with talk of a of a of a however. 
Um, so what's going on? Yes. Yeah, so, so focus focus specifically on the uh, these these tablets from the village of Tataria, uh, w- where these symbols they, they seem to be forming a, a kind of writing. Yeah. So there is controversy around the tablets. I, I mentioned in the first half that the, these got baked supposedly to preserve them, and that the effect of that is that you can't carbon date it. And people have argued that this is suspicious. I mean, it's the carbon dating is it's so important to carbon date them. Yeah. And, you know, it's possible that there's a problem with that. People have argued that if they are authentic, if, you know, if they do come from 5,500 BC, then perhaps they bear the, the, the stamp of Sumerian proto-cuneiform. That, you know, because this is around 5,500 BC, these sorts of symbols are being developed in Mesopotamia. So perhaps there are links. People have argued that perhaps it got jumbled up in the excavations and actually it comes from a, a higher layer. So okay. yeah. perhaps it got confused. And there are people who argue that they're straight forgeries. So there's no, there's no consensus on that, really. Forgeries done by, but they, they were from Romania, not Serbia. So they wouldn't have been forged by Serbian nationalists or something. But they might be forged by Romanian nationalists or whatever. I, right. I think I think the it's very much kind of open question on that. But even you see, even if even if we put them to one side and say it's not conclusively proven, and lots and lots of archaeologists and scholars do accept that they're authentic. There are lots who accept right. that they're authentic. Are they writing? So there's a, there's a whole range of things that they could be. Because they're to give people a sense, they are. I mean, you were talking about them before. There's one circular, two rectangular. They are kind of. There's a picture of what looks like a goat. There's a couple of pictures of, frankly, what look like stools or toilets. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are swastikas. There are crosses. There are kind of the. Ob- there there are kind of quite obvious symbols. Yeah. But the problem is, is we just don't have the context. That would enable scholars to evaluate them and come to a conclusive conclusion. Yeah. So we don't have the equivalent of a Rosetta Stone, obviously, because you know, these are earlier by about two thousand years ahead of any mm-hmm. distinguishable writing system. So they could be, you know, decorations. Uh, they could be ownership markings, or they could be some form of early proto writing. Yeah. And part of the problem is that. The idea that they might be proto writing generates incredibly intense passions on on both sides. Right. So, by and large, Serbian nationalists are very, very keen on this idea that Serbia is indeed the birthplace of the earliest form of writing, and that there have been kind of uh, on the absolute wacko fringe. There are there there are people there are people who have kind of faked scholarly identities, put out bogus scholarly articles, all kinds of things, arguing that not only is it a, a form of writing, but it is actually a form of proto-Serbian. Serbian, it goes well, right. the, the Slavic language. Absolutely, the Slavs weren't even in the Balkans in yeah. the uh, yeah this point. So <laughs> there's a professor whose entire career seems to have been invented, right? And and he argues that uh, not only is 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 this script found on the um the tatarian um tablets proto-serbian that etruscan also is a form of serbian <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and so he 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 wrote this 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 article in which he claimed the etruscan word roots are slovene and the archaeological documentation for this is so obvious that it cannot be overlooked right and the whole story is very very umberto echo i mean it's yeah. it's 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 a great story. It seems improbable, but but there are absolutely you know there are very very distinguished linguists who take it, it highly seriously. So there's an article online by a, a, a guy called Toby Griffin who is a professor at Southern Illinois University, a linguist, and he extrapolates from it from these symbols words for for bird, for goddess, and for bear. Words. I mean, I'm looking at these symbols and thinking. Well, they're, sim- they're, they're, they're symbols. Uh, who knows what the actual word is? Yeah. But 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 you can using the symbols, you can work. He he says you can work out what 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 they would denote what, what these denote. And so he has this extraordinary sentence where he says the oldest known sentence in human language states. Do you want to know the oldest known sentence in human language? I'd love to, Tom. The bear goddess and the bird goddess are the bear goddess indeed. 
It's disappointing, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> well, you may say disappointing, but I think Professor Toby Griffin would beg to disagree because well, he... I'm not shooting. He's just the messenger, Tom. I'm not shooting the messenger. <laughs> You are shooting him down. This is his great insight. He's got the oldest known sentence in human language. You're sneering at it. Which stone is this of the three stones I'm looking at? Can't remember. I don't know. You don't know. That's disappointing. I can't remember. I think it's two lines. It's two lines. It's two lines with a squiggle and it's three lines with a squiggle. Yeah. But he, his argument, and you may remember that uh, that Milhave Basic ends up arguing that the, the Finch culture came from Greece, that it was a Greek colony. Yeah. And again, uh, Professor Griffin is seizing on the parallels with Greece because he's saying, okay, well, what's a, a, a bear goddess and a, be- and a bird goddess? And he, he, the figure that he fixes on is the figure of Artemis, who um, has bears. She associates with bears. She's the mistress of the beasts. And his argument is that this, is, this sentence is looking forward to millennia and millennia of mythological tradition that will culminate in the figure of Artemis. This is thousands of years before Artemis, though, isn't it, Tom? It is thousands and thousands of years before. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that seems a massive stretch to me. I mean, even bigger stretch than the stuff about the bird. Well, the bear. You, may, you may think so, but yeah. it, it is an argument that has been advanced by a, a very eminent and very celebrated archaeologist and anthropologist called Marija Gimbutas. Have you, have you heard of her? Yeah, I have. I'm very familiar with her work. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, you, I haven't talked about <laughs> so, so she is, she is famous. I mean, yeah. She's famous as, as probably the most famous feminist archaeologist of the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. Okay. So she, she escaped the Russian occupation uh, after the war, ended up in, uh, in Berkeley in California. Mm-hmm. And she was a great enthusiast for the idea that the original peoples of what she calls old Europe, and so this is a civilization based in Serbia, yeah. that they had worshipped a, a, a mother goddess. And she argues that this, this culture of, of old Europe, that uh, it had extended as far as the Aegean, uh, so the islands in the Aegean, it extended as far as Crete, it extended as far as uh, Sicily, and that it was essentially peaceful. So you were asking what kind of culture did it have? Yeah. There doesn't seem yeah. to be any evidence of, of warfare. So there's no weapons. That it was, no, that it was, that it was egalitarian. Uh, that it was goddess-centered, and that it was matriarchal. So hold on, she's a feminist seventies archaeologist. She is, and she's found something that you know a seventies feminist archaeologist would want to find. Yes, yeah. Uh, and so she she wrote that the inhabitants of southeastern Europe seven thousand years ago were not the primitive villages of the incipient Neolithic. Instead, they involved a unique cultural pattern contemporary with similar developments in Anatolia, Mesopotamia, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. But her argument is that more than any of those other proto civilizations that will go on to become you know the, the, the great motors of of uh, a civilization. Yeah, that. The Vincher civilization, the civilization of old Europe, as she calls it, that was the civilization that was most like a feminist hippie in California yeah. in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, How unusual for an academic to find in the past <laughs> what they would like to see in the present. <laughs> so, and the obvious question is well, you know, she talks about civilizations of Mesopotamia or, or Egypt, they go on to become famous yeah. centers of civilization. So what happens to the venture culture? Yeah. Why, why does it collapse? Why has no one heard of it? What happened to it? And her argument is, is that it gets destroyed by the Indo-Europeans. So the Indo-Europeans are the people who linguists have worked out are the people who spread the languages that become the languages of Northern India and Europe. So it would include Sanskrit it would include ancient Greek, it would include Latin, and into the contemporary it would include Hindi, it would include Italian, and it would include English. Right. And big mystery, where you know, where did the Indo-Europeans come? She argues that the Indo-Europeans come from basically uh, you, the region of Ukraine, actually, around Ukraine. Um, mm-hmm. And she argues that they're violent, they're patriarchal, they don't worship mother goddesses, they worship sky gods. So... Jupiter, Zeus, yeah. Pater, uh, the father's use, the father of, you know, these, these domineering sky gods. Rough men. Absolute boo hiss. Yeah. Boo hiss. So you, you have this peaceful, matriarchal civilization with their language and their beautiful pots and all that kind of stuff. And then these Indo-Europeans in there with their horses 
turn up and destroy everything. Tom, I don't want to lapse into total self-parody. I mean, frankly, that ship has probably sailed many <laughs> podcasts ago. And nor do I want to appear like I'm just the miserable skeptic who doesn't know anything about prehistoric history and is just pouring scorn on everything. But that sounds like total tosh to me. It just sounds like complete wish fulfillment. I don't think it's total tosh, but, but, but I think that it is a kind of Rorschach test. Yeah. Um, and I think that just as with you know, forgeries, it takes maybe a few decades before you can recognize the period where the forgery is painted. So, you know, if you have a, a, a Renaissance painting that's forged in the 1920s, you know, it could take you 50 years before you look at it and say, that's a very, you know, that was clearly painted in the 1920s. Yeah. I think in a similar way, perhaps with academic fashion, particularly when it's something like prehistory, where the evidence is so sparse yeah. and it, it can take time perhaps for you to see that academic fashions are yeah. absolutely reflective of broader cultural and social trends. For the last five minutes, I felt like I'm trapped in a California seminar room in 1974. <laughs> well, so, so today, the, the consensus among archaeologists about this is what happened to the venture civilization is that they weren't overthrown by a violent invasion, that the Indo-Europeans, when they came, that it was a much more peaceful process of integration. That's all the rage now with academics. Yeah. And also that uh, the Victor civilization were destroyed by basically environmental degradation. I was just that about they to exhausted say. exhausted the soils and they wiped out wildlife. Do you know, before you started that sentence, I thought to myself, <laughs> I'll jump in and I'll say, <laughs> I bet academics now think it was climate change. And of course they do. So the argument is that it, now that it's climate change or it's environmental degradation and that there was no violent invasion by immigrants but that they were peacefully in integrated. Kindly multiculturalism. So I, I, I'm, who knows? Again, I just don't think that probably that the evidence is there. But again, I suspect that perhaps in 50 years, people will look back and say, well. Of course, people in 2020. You know, that's yeah. very reflective of, of broader intellectual and, and, and cultural opinion. So the great thing about the Vinci culture then, Tom, is that it's actually a window into changing. Yeah, it's as interesting academic. about about academia in yeah. the 20th and 21st century as it is about. I mean, actually, you know, it's an amazing civilization. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it, it it is incredible. These settlements do exist. The copper smelting did happen. These weird squiggles, you know, it doesn't matter if they're a language or not. I mean, there's some something weird going on there. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. art is incredible. The figurative stuff is incredible. When we advertise this, I will put up, you know, images from it. It it is there. But I, I just don't think that we. It would seem that we know enough to arrive at a conclusive opinion either way. We should sort of end the podcast not by talking about academic fashion, but by talking about the civilization itself. So, of course, you're not, you know, a, a sort of card carrying, massively specialised expert on this. No, I literally found out about it a week ago. <laughs> but, well, that's all you need. I mean, that's all you need. Come on. But what do you think? Because you know a lot about sort of neolithic stuff and all that i know business. that i don't know i know okay. that i don't know but what i what i, what I would say but is that the dates that, the dates, that, the dates they, are, are right i are was they? really astounded yeah i had not expected that and what also surprises me is that it's not better known well that's astounding isn't it that it's not because better known. this really isn't kind of on the radar but that's because it's in serbia right so if it was in britain in germany in france yeah. It'd be a big tourist destination. There'd be a huge visitor center. Well, and I think there'd probably be a kind of slightly nationalist strain. Of course there would. The kids, would do it with, kids would do it in primary school. Yeah. Wouldn't they? Absolutely yeah. they would. People would dress up as members of the Vincha, as matriarchs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. That's the problem. You have to, it's, it's very difficult to extrapolate from the found, you know, from the remains that have been found, any sense of what, how these function and what happened to them. Yeah. And that's why I think they're vulnerable to, to, to kind of trends. But there's also that extraordinary mystery about the disappearance. Because, I mean, for, for, for such a civilization so far ahead of its time to have flourished and then vanished. Okay, so that's one final thing, is that the two leading figures in the study of this, so Milahe Vasic and Marija Gimbatas, that, you know, these are the two top, top names in the field. Both of them are absolutely alert to a feeling that something about this culture ends up being expressed in Minoan and Cycladic, so the, the civilization of kind of pre-classical Aegean. Yeah. And Gimbertus' argument that the Indo-Europeans come in and they, you know, they wipe the floor with, with the Vinci culture and it all gets obliterated. Her argument is that traces of this survive in, uh, on islands in the Aegean, so in, on Crete, in the, the Cyclades in the Aegean. And, you know, there are 
they, they do seem to be to the untrained eye, to my untrained eye, they do seem to be similarities. And obviously, these two great figures involved in the study of this culture mm -hmm. sense that as well. Yeah, uh, you know, and they spent a lifetime studying it. So not a week. Who am I to, who am I to sneer at it? Uh, yeah. So th I think there is something mysterious there. God, what a fascinating story! You know, if there are scholars listening to this who are specialists in it. Let us know what you think. Uh, Tom, I, I, I sincerely hope there haven't been scholars <laughs> so this so in it. Um, can you visit it? Can you go and see, is there a museum in Serbia? Yeah, there are. Yeah. Gosh, we should, uh, we should, we should do a rest is history. Serbian well, talk. I, I, I'm so thrilled that you, um, you, you finally, you finally got <laughs> my interested heart in history. It, it plummeted I it. like a stone <laughs> when you turned out you weren't going to do <laughs> Stefan Dushan. And actually this was brilliant. I really enjoyed this. Oh, well, thanks. I, um, I, I learned a lot and I love these. I, I love it when we end a podcast by just basically saying, we don't know and we'll never, we'll probably never know. And that sense of the mystery of the past, I think is really important. And when we're claiming to, as we often do on this podcast, to know everything, we don't really. So it's great to end in the sort of the mists of time. Known unknowns. Yes, known unknowns. There you go. I'm all about the mist of time. Tom is all about Donald Rumsfeld. That's the dynamic that has made this podcast um, beloved by both its listeners. And um, <laughs> we'll be back, won't we, Tom, with more World Cup um, known unknowns um, next time. And that's a known known. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.